Hello and welcome. My name is Arun Patwardhan and today I will be talking about shell scripting. This is the first part in a multi-part series that will be covering different aspects of scripting. In today's session we will be looking at different aspects of shell scripting such as what does it mean to create shell scripts? Why do we need them? All the things that we would need in order to create our own shell script. And finally, how to go about creating our own shell scripts. Let us first look at what a shell script is. Shell scripts are simply files that list out a series of commands in the sequence in which they are to be executed. By commands, we typically mean other shell commands. But these could also be other executables, scripts, or commands from other languages. So why would we need to create them? There are several reasons. The most common reason being automation. For example, if there are steps that we perform on a repeated basis, such as checking for the presence or absence of particular files, we could easily automate this task with the help of a script. Or, if we want to perform certain tasks at scale, such as creating a set of files and folders that should always be there within the user's home folder. Scripting also has the added benefit of consistency. By performing the tasks the same way, we can ensure that our desired outcome is the same each and every time. Before we go ahead and look at how to create our own scripts, there are a few things we need to keep ready at hand. First, we would need to know the commands we would have to execute to achieve our goal. This list is quite large and one would not necessarily know all the commands supported. But over time, your knowledge of these commands will grow, so don't worry. Second, we need to pick a shell in interpreter. I will talk about that momentarily. We also need to decide how we will be accessing the command line interface. This would most likely be via the terminal application, but there are other ways of accessing the command line too. Finally, we need to decide on the editor we will be using to create our scripts. I will talk about this a little later. Now, before we go ahead, while this and subsequent articles will be focusing on shell scripting in macOS, the concepts themselves are applicable to Unix and Linux operating systems too. Also, I will be creating most of the scripts on macOS Big Sur. This shouldn't be a problem in most cases. However, it is important to keep in mind that some features and commands may not be available in all versions of macOS. Before we start writing shell scripts, it's important that we get familiar with the command line interface. Once we have created our scripts, we will be invoking them from the command line. So it is important that we get familiar with it. Secondly, we will need to know some basic commands. Commands that will help us compose our scripts. There are multiple options available to access the command line interface. The most popular option is to use the built-in terminal application. Another option is to use SSH, though this is popular for remote environments only. There may be third-party tools that let you do the same, but we won't look into those options. For the remainder of the sessions, we will be using the terminal application. Let us look, explore the terminal application interface a bit. If you haven't already opened the terminal app, go ahead and launch it via the launchpad or from the application's utilities folder. You could also use Spotlight to launch the application. Right at the top of the terminal window, you should notice the current shell interpreter. By default, it is ZSH for macOS Catalina and later. Of course, you can change it if you want. Next, we can see the username for the currently logged in user, followed by 
the name of our computer. The percentage symbol indicates the prompt and the cursor indicates where we will be invoking our scripts form and that's where our commands are going to go in. There are several commands available in macOS. We will be learning about quite a few of those over the course of the next few articles. The table shows a list of some of the very commonly used commands. For example, cd, which is change directory. This is the command that we will be using to navigate to another folder. mv, or the move command, which is used to move files and folders from one folder to another. ls, or the list command, is used to list the contents of a folder. The rm command is used to remove files and folders. The cp command is used to copy files and folders from one location to another. And the chmod command is used to change permissions on files and folders. In fact, most commands have a typical structure. They all start off with the command itself, such as cd, rm, mv, ls. The command is followed by zero or more options. Options are a way of providing subcommands to our parent command. Typically, options have a dash or minus sign before it, but that may not always be the case. Also, it's possible that in some situations, an option may be represented with more than one option values. They may or may not be case sensitive. They may have a full name instead of a character or both. Always refer to the documentation of a command before using an option. The next thing which may come could be arguments. So there may be zero or more arguments. Arguments are how we provide external data to our commands. And finally, we may have more arguments or op options that may be required. It is also possible to ch chain the output of this command to the next one. Information as to what is required to successfully execute a command comes from the man page. Here is an example of the command. This is the copy command. This command will copy all the items from the project report folder into the user shared folder. Let us break it down part by part to understand what is happening. First, we have the command itself. Second, we have the option R. This indicates that the command should be applied recursively to all the files and folders within our source folder. Third is the argument. The argument here specifies the path of the folder which is to be copied. Fourth, we have yet another argument. This one specifies the path to the destination folder where the items from the source folder are to be copied. Let us look at a more complex example. This is the diskutil command, specific to macOS. This command will generate a list of crypto users and export the results as a plist format. This output is then redirected to the user's list plist file within the documents folder. Let us see how this command works. First, we have the command itself. Second, we have an option, which is APFS, indicating that we want to perform an APFS-related operation. Third, we have the second option or argument, which indicates that we want a list of crypto users. Fourth, we have a third option. This indicates that the results which are generated must be done in the plist format. Fifth, we have the fir our first argument. This indicates the volume for which the command must be run on. Sixth, now this is a little different. 
The two greater than symbols indicate the redirect operator. Commands typically print the results on standard output, which is the terminal window. The redirect operator instead redirects the output to a file instead of printing it out on standard out. We will see this operator in greater detail in later sessions. We can see that there is no fixed predefined template to commands. They can also be very long, but that depends on several factors. As I mentioned before, there are several commands available in macOS. Your knowledge of these commands will grow over time. However, if there is one command that you should remember, then it is the man or manual command. This command gives direct access to the documentation for a command. In fact, here is a nice tip. Run the command man followed by option T followed by the name of the command whose man page you want to open, followed by the pipe to pipe the output to the next command, which is the open command that opens a specified application in the graphical user interface. This long command allows us to view the man page from within the preview app itself. Now let's talk about the shell interpreter. The shell interpreter is, as the name says, the object that will interpret the commands and execute them. The default shell interpreter for macOS is ZSH, starting macOS Catalina. However, we can choose to use that or any other interpreter we wish. While most commands we will be using will be common ones that are available across all interpreters, be aware that some commands may be unique to certain interpreters only. One of the things we will encounter is a tool that we would need to write our scripts. There are many editors available. Some are free, some are paid. You can choose whichever editor you feel most comfortable with. In fact, you don't have to use any special editor at all. As I mentioned earlier, a shell script is just a file that contains a list of commands. You could use the built-in text edit application or any other plain text editor for this. Now that we know what is needed, let us get started with scripting. In order to build our script, let us take a simple scenario. Let us suppose that every user in our organization must have the following folders. So in the home folder, they should have Tools, reports, help. Maybe these folders contain files that will be essential for the organization. I've just created these folders from the graphical user interface. But let us suppose we wanted to create a script to do just this. As a first, we will replicate these actions from the terminal application manually. So let me delete these folders. And I'm going to keep the graphical user interface, the finder window open on the side so that we can see the effects immediately. I will launch the terminal application. So just a quick recap of things. I'm currently using ZShell as my shell interpreter. That's my username, computer name, the prompt, and this is where I'll be typing the command. One thing I didn't mention was the location of the present working directory here. So this indicates the folder I'm currently present in. If I just type CD, which is the command to change directory, and press return, Notice the location of the folder has changed to tilde, which represents the currently logged in user's home folder. 
also as far as the terminal application is concerned if you're wondering how I got this uh, visual appearance and um, maybe you, you have a different appearance it depends on a couple of things firstly it depends on whether you have light or dark mode second if you go to terminal preferences under profiles you can create your own profile out here by taking an existing one and say duplicating it where you can change the color effects, font, colors used for the text the opacity which is what gives the transparency behind all those settings and of course you can mark this as the default profile so that every time when you open terminal it opens up with this visual interpretation of it. And of course, on the general, you can say new profile in Windows open with your newly created profile. So those are a couple of things out of the way. Now, let us recreate the steps we performed in the graphical user interface. The first thing we did, and I'll just increase the size of my font for terminal. So keyboard shortcut is command plus. The first thing we want to do is go to the home folder. I can just type cd and press return. So change directory and by default it goes to the home folder. Or I could explicitly say tilde slash which will take me to the currently logged in users home folder. Or if I wanted to, I could type out the absolute path. Multiple ways of doing it. Note, when I was typing, I pressed tab to autocomplete. It's a very useful way, especially if you have to type a very long path. Also helps reduce errors that may come in because of spelling mistakes. If I want to find out which folder I'm currently in, I could run the pwd command, which prints the present working directory. So that's the first step I would take if I wanted to replicate these actions. cd to the home folder. Now we will create the three folders in our home folder. The command to create a folder is mkdir. mkdir tools mkdr reports mkdr help and notice as I'm typing the commands in the command line interface they are appearing in the graphical user interface help reports tools it's straightforward and simple we are just replicating the steps we had performed graphically earlier. Now, one of the other things that we can do is to create an empty file, an empty hidden file inside each of these folders. First off, why would we want to do this? It's very common in scripting to create an empty hidden file and keep. It's a kind of a flag to indicate that the script ran, it performed all the tasks successfully. A kind of way of saying, I was here, message. Very easy to create. So what I will be doing is, I will be using the cd command to go into the tools folder. Now since we are already in the home folder, I do not have to type the entire path to the tools command. Or if I wanted to, I could do just that. So I could type the entire path out or I could just say CD tools. Notice that the present working directory is presenting the tools folder, the name of the folder we are currently in. And I could list the contents of the folder. Of course, there's nothing in there. We've just created it, but I could always list the contents of the folder to see what's there. Now, finally, I will create the empty hidden file. 
The easiest way to do that is to use the touch command. Touch dot tools folder creator. The touch command is used to update the timestamp of a file. Of course, if the file doesn't exist, it will go ahead and create the file for us. But any subsequent attempts to run this command will just update the timestamp. And by prefixing the name of the file with a dot, it is going to hide the file for us in the graphical user interface. Again, since I did not provide any path, it is going to create that file in the present folder, which is the tools folder. If I use the list command, I don't see anything. But if I use the list command with the A option, it shows me hidden items, including the file I just created. And of course, we can confirm that by going into the graphical user interface, where, as you can see, the file is not visible. I will step back to the previous folder or one folder out, which is the home folder, go into the reports folder and repeat the process. And do the same thing for the help. Of course, if you're troubleshooting and you would quickly like to see hidden files in the graphical user interface, you can use the keyboard shortcut shift command period to temporarily show hidden files. And you can see there are many other files which are slightly grayed out, which are hidden by default. And notice you can now see the files in the tools folder, in the reports folder, and the help folder. And you can press shift command period to stop showing the hidden files again. So that's it. Those are the commands that I will be running to create these files and folders. Now let's suppose I wanted to do this on a whole bunch of computers in the organization. The best thing to do would be to put these commands in a script. So let's recap the steps that we performed. We first went to the user's home folder, created three folders using the mkdir command, went into each folder, use the touch command to create an empty hidden file, and that's it. So now we will be creating a script that will be replicating these steps. Since we will be testing this, I will delete these folders again. And now I will use text edit to create a script. As I said, you could use any editor that you want. I'll be using text edit, but I probably will be using other tools over the next few videos to just illustrate how you could use some other tools. If you're using text edit, we don't have to worry about fancy fonts and colors because it's just a plain script. For a file, we will go to format and make plain text, which gets rid of all the fancy formatting. Now, when we are writing a script file, our script file always begins with the shebang operator. This is used to specify the shell interpreter that will be used by our script. In our case, we are using the Z shell interpreter. In fact, let me increase the font a bit. I'm using the same keyboard shortcut command plus. Now, as we spoke earlier, a shell script 
is nothing but a file that lists out commands in the sequence in which they are to be executed. So the sequence was first go to the home folder. Now watch out for this in the text edit application. It tries to change the spelling to match the English language convention where the sentence starts with an uppercase character. We do not want that. Click on the cross to say, no, I don't want the spelling to be converted. Watch out for this. Some other specialized editors will not prompt you for this and therefore they may be easier to use. Anyway, coming back, the first step was to go to the home folder. So CD to the home folder. The next step was to create the three folders. MKDIR, I'll press escape to not change the first letter to capital. MKDR tools, MKDR reports, MKDR. There you go. I missed it I, in my rush. I did not press escape. It wrote it with a capital M. MKDIR. We create three folders. Next, we will go ahead and create the empty files. So CD, tools, touch, dot, tools, folder, created, CD, And in fact, that's the same thing I will do for the reports in the help folder. The same commands that we've been running in the terminal application sometime back. Same. There you go. Now all I will do is I will save the script on the desktop. I'll call it folder creator. You can give it any name. The ex extension ZSH. I don't want the TXT extension. And let's save it. In fact, let's hide this now. So how do we run this script? Well, there are a couple of ways. We can use the ZSH command and pass the path to our script as is without doing anything else. You can see there you go and I just unhide or there you go tools, reports. Reports help. all of them created. So I could run it using the ZSH command or I could just give execute privileges to this file. So let me go to the desktop folder and I'll use the list command with the long form option to list the contents of my desktop which currently says there's just this one file and these are the permissions out there for owner, group and everyone else. I want to add the execute capability to go ahead and say chmod user group and others add the execute capability for the folder creator file. Now before I run the command, let me just drag my finder window below. Let's run list. And there you go. You can see I've got my execute permissions. And now I can directly just 
run this particular script and you can see three items have popped up here. We can make the script even better. by using another command known as echo. Echo just repeats whatever is there. As you can see, it takes the string and repeats it out here, like an echo. So this is a good way of printing messages out on standard output. Standard output is what you see in the command line out here. So I could put an echo message to indicate starting script. Echo creating folders, tools, reports, help. creating hidden files. Script completed successfully. Have a nice day. So it's a good way of giving messages out to the person who's running the script that way they can find out what's going on. Is the script still running? Is it stuck? Was it successful? Was it not successful? And I will just save my script. I don't need to go and change the permissions again or anything of that sort. It's already done. So I can just say folder creating. There you go. Starting script, creating folders, creating hidden files, script completed successfully, have a nice day. And I can see all the items created perfectly. As you can see, it's very easy to create scripts. It's very easy to go ahead and modify scripts. And all I have to do now is just share this script on other computers, ask the person to run the script which could also be potentially either by well double clicking it depending on the extensions you've given so if you wanted to do that well here's another tool by the way it is the xcode tool let's copy folder creator to folder so it's going to copy your file from one place to another that's the same location with a different name. And of course I've got a stack view out here which I won't use. But notice the second one doesn't have an extension. It's got the executable attribute. If I use the list long form option you can see they have the execute privileges. And now if I want, I could just run the script. So before I run it, let's delete this. There you go. So now the script can directly be run from the graphical user interface by any user you share it with. And they'll get all the folders that you want. The script executes perfectly along with the messages that were being printed out. And there you go. It's that simple to create scripts. To summarize, scripts are very easy to create. As you write them more often, over time you will find that there are more commands available and there are more things that can be done. A good way to prepare for this would be to identify situations or scenarios 
in your current environment which can be replaced with scripts. These situations have typical characteristics. We need to perform the tasks repeatedly. This needs to be done very quickly and more than one person may need the same tasks to be performed. If you find yourself faced with these requirements, then you may want to consider using scripts. Now that we have seen how to create our first script, in the next video we will be taking this a little further and making our scripts a little more powerful. Thank you.